and welcome to the next episode of This Healthy Life. My name is Erica Schlick, your host, also known as The Trail to Health, and very excited to have Kenzie here with us today. Kenzie Vath is a passionate Lyme warrior serving on the board of the Global Lyme Alliance. She's also the Vice President of Strategic Innovation at Pacific Hospitality Group, leading innovative initiatives and the dedicated founder and president of Impact 100 OC. She's committed to making a huge impact of positive change in her community, and I'm so happy to have her here as a guest today. Kenzie, welcome. How are you doing today? Oh my gosh, amazing. And thank you so much for the kind introduction. Of course. I, it's just such a full plate there. So. <laughs> you are definitely doing a lot, and I'm so excited to dive in and hear all about it. Yes. So yeah. you do amazing advocacy work in the Lyme community and sounds like in many other communities as well. Uh, can you briefly share a little bit about your, your Lyme journey and what led you to doing this kind of work? Sure. Well, I, you know, I'm so lucky to have met you on my Lyme journey and all the work that you're doing and the advocacy work in the Lyme space and chronic illness space. I know you and I are both, as much as our paths have met, we've been so busy trying to help others and grow our careers and businesses. So a kudos to you as well. Thank you. I, you know, my Lyme journey began at a very young age and, um, you know, I kind of share some of the same highlights, but I was misdiagnosed for about 10 years of my journey. It started, my symptoms started kind of around puberty, I would say nine or 10 years old. Um, The symptoms started more with neurological issues, uh, learning disabilities. Then it uh, progressed to joint pain, chronic inflammation, chronic illness. I I kept getting, you know, every cold, every flu, out of school a lot, and then behavioral um, struggling, then went into, you know, anxiety and depression. That was probably like the turning point for my parents, for sure. It was a godly situation that I was even diagnosed. Mm-hmm. I went to this this event that my parents are involved in for the Catholic Church and Dr. Dino Prado, who runs Invita Medical Clinic was uh, speaking this night. And my dad couldn't go for whatever reason. And my mom said, hey, honey, do you wanna come and like learn about this thing? I know how much you love like medical stuff mm-hmm. because I was always in search of answers. Yeah. I never got answers from doctors in and out of so many doctor's offices, never felt supported or heard. So I was always um, a self-seeking patient. So I said, sure, why not? I don't even know how I even got uh, mucked up the courage and the energy to go to this event, but I ended up going and it was a God thing because that night he spoke about Lyme disease and I looked at my mom and she looked at me and we just started tearing up immediately. I knew that was some, that was it. That Mm -hmm. was the answer. So after the event, we walked up to him, we said, Hey, you know, I've been struggling with chronic illness. These are all the things going on. He said, fly to Arizona, come to the clinic. Let's do some testing. Let's figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. And then I got my diagnosis. So I didn't even get diagnosed here in California, and that's kind of one of the reasons, one of the smaller reasons of why I got more involved in the nonprofit work and the advocacy work, because I know so many people in in California that are suffering from chronic Lyme, yep. but they, people are still telling them that it doesn't exist here, yep. and it's just not right. Yep. And even if they didn't get infected here or whatever, it still exists. It still exists People move from state to state, country to country. You can be on vacation on the East Coast and pick it up and, you know, where it is more common. But California is actually super endemic in in Lyme as well. I myself got it here in California, so I know it's here. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. So that was one of the smaller, you know, reasons why getting involved. But the diagnosis was just, as you know, one step on the journey, right? It's just the beginning of another journey. It was. And there was relief, obviously, because I had an answer Mm -hmm. finally. And I think people who are suffering from chronic illness and not knowing why is probably the harder struggle than the treatment because you're not, you don't feel heard and you don't know. You really, it's just the unknown. Like what is going on with me? How serious is this? What can I do to treat it or help it or research it? Um, And there's a lot of 
a lot of people who suffer in silence. And, and so you feel so dismissed by the medical community too. You know, I remember when I was first starting my journey, I'd go to doctors and they do just the kind of the general labs. They're like, well, everything's fine. You're perfectly healthy. I'm mm -hmm. like, but I feel like I'm dying. I can't drive. I can't think I can't work anymore. Like I'm not perfectly healthy. Like there's something seriously wrong. And, you know, even if I had been tested for Lyme, it probably wouldn't have been the proper testing uh, to even you know, be able to diagnose it most likely. So it's just like, there's so many hurdles in, in being diagnosed and being heard um, in the Lyme community. Yeah. And the gas, getting the gaslighting for sure is, is a real deal. Um, and not just in the medical community, but I think it's really hard too for your family and friends to understand your inner circle. And a mm -hmm. lot of people who suffer with chronic illness and Lyme disease, you know, they lose a lot of that inner circle and it leads to a lot more um, mental health issues. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's evident that yeah. it would lead to that. And you struggle with even having a conversation with anybody because you're afraid that, you know, you're going to forget what you're, mm -hmm. you're trying to say, or, I mean, it happens to me all the time. Like yeah. I have to pause and think like, wait, what, where was I going? Or like, what, like, you know, some of that brain fog mm -hmm. still lingers. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm better on most days than others, but I do have that like social fear sometimes of losing that train of thought or sounding like I don't know what I'm talking about when I really do like internally, but yep. sometimes it's it hard to get it out. out. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That disconnect too. So the diagnosis be... was. Oh, oh go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say the diagnosis was, you know, just the step one to the journey, as you know, and then the chapter started to like unfold mm -hmm. of like where that was going to lead me. And then it was another 10 years of treatment on my Lyme journey. I did everything under the sun, um, similar to you and others. Mm -hmm. um, I tried, you know, it was, I think what was so odd about that time period, because I wasn't diagnosed until about 2008, I think 2008, um, 2009, this is like the summer going into my uh, freshman year of college. So I was diagnosed. And during that time for Lyme disease, even though there was, a, there was research being done prior to that, the treatment protocols were unknown. People yeah. didn't really know how to treat chronic Lyme because like chronic Lyme didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And you had to find these like specialty doctors that like were not you know, getting their licenses revoked yep. uh, to be able to even treat this. And then when you found those good doctors, they were really just testing and trialing things based on what was successful for their other patients. Yep. So there wasn't enough definitive research around the treatment protocol. So it was really, you're trying everything. And I, just I a giant experiment. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. And like, then what works for one person doesn't necessarily work for the next person. So it's not like you, once you find something that works that you can just carbon copy it for all your, your patients or all the treatments, like everyone is so individual depending on like what co-infections they have and you know, what sort of like genetics they have and all those things that just complexify the disease so much. Yeah, for sure. And I feel like the best doctors and LLMDs in the field really have to take this disease and think about it holistically to your point, because yeah. they don't, they cannot just be treating the disease. They have to be treating the person mm -hmm. because some people are not going to respond to treatment that potentially could be per, uh, effective for yeah. the bacteria just because of the way the person is built, their profile, their genetics, their history, their background. And I also think what's not spoken about that I, I do want to bring up is you have to be willing to fight. Like the people that make it out of this illness are the ones that like they have a purpose, mm -hmm. they're focused on that purpose, and they're willing to do whatever it takes to get out of it. If you get stuck in the, in the thought that you – just take this one thing and you're going to be cured or like, you know, oh, I don't want to do that. It's like, I, I don't want to give up drinking or yep. I don't want to eat healthy. Yep. You're not going to make it. You're mm -hmm. not going to make, you're not going to get to a place where you're thriving. Mm -hmm. You're going to be stuck in that constant fight. And so you have to be willing to do the fight, to put in the work, put in the effort to get to that next level. And to it's be definitely able to function definitely not an easy fix. You know, like a lot of times you're like, oh, people think you can just take antibiotics or do a treatment and you'll be better in a couple months. And it's really at least a two to three year commitment of doing serious heavy work on yourself and your body before you start to even feel somewhat human again and somewhat normal. And 
thankfully like for many there is a light at the end of the tunnel but a lot of other people struggle for years and years and years and try different treatments and they still haven't found the thing that's going to help them so you can definitely lose strength and hope in that process if nothing is working and you know you're not getting those right treatments yeah I agree I think that's where the Lyme community really needs to come together and those that are diagnosed need to reach out to organizations mm-hmm. like Global Lyme Alliance for the resources yep. to to help them fight because there are other people out there suffering, a lot of people, mm-hmm. by the way, as you and I know, yep. once you put yourself out there and share your story as well, like it's amazing how you're flooded with yep. people that have a similar one. Or everyone you meet has help. knows someone with Lyme or someone that relates yes. or like a friend of theirs or someone has mystery illness that they don't know what's quite wrong with them. And, you know, I'm always saying, have you, have you looked into Lyme? I know you may not think you have it. I didn't think I had it, but it's more common than you actually think and something worth ruling out to see if that's what's, you know causing all your ailments. So completely. So speaking of Global Lyme Alliance, that's how you and I met at one of the events, which is so amazing. And now you're serving on the board, which is so incredible. I'm so excited for you. Can you share a little bit more about some of the work you're doing with GLA and some of the things that you're most excited about that they're working on as well? Oh my gosh, I'm just so excited and I'm so honored to be a part of it, honestly. And how serendipitous that you and I meet at this event for, you know, a local organization that wanted to support and have a table. I think that was so awesome. Absolutely. You know, we need more people to stand up and get involved in in Lyme advocacy work. But yes, very honored. Um, Obviously newest to the board, uh, coming in with a very fresh perspective, as is our new um, CEO, mm-hmm. uh, Laura McNeil. She is amazing. Honestly, so excited for her to come in and really look at the organization as with a fresh set of eyes, mm-hmm. essentially, but also look at it in terms of of how we grow, how we support our communities that are feeding into us how we can support other nonprofits. I think that's one of my personal goals is creating synergy and connection between the top Lyme organizations. And I've had, it's been a whirlwind in the past four months, I would say, of just connecting with all of these amazing organizations, supporting Limeys across the U.S. and some globally as well, but Mm -hmm. we haven't really tapped into the global piece and we need to do better. We're going to do better. I would say- that's what we're looking to do at GLA is create more synergy as an organization with others and with the the community we serve, Lyme warriors and chronic illness, as well as supporting the right research. So mm-hmm. at GLA, what differentiates ourselves is our grants. Our grant giving goes directly to Lyme research. Awesome. And, you know, to a variety of different research, there's a ton. And on our website, it actually we've done a better job. Our website's a little dense. We're doing some work on that. Our marketing team, uh, you know, Lindsay, she's amazing. She's working on on that to ensure that the information is more tangible for the average, you know, goer who's Mm -hmm. doing research. But what, what we're focused on is not just testing, but treatment opportunities um, and other. And Mm -hmm. I think that's really important. And, and for Lyme, for Bartonella, for PANS, there's a lot of these, you know, other diagnoses Mm -hmm. that all that kind of fall in with Lyme or have co, you know, the co-infections with Lyme that it's hard to almost wrap your head around because there's so much, but we are funding research in all those departments because we think that there will be a break in in one of those to help get more answers. Mm -hmm. And Personally, I think my goal with GLA is one to bring a fresh perspective, which I definitely, I definitely am doing with my my pink hair and my crazy <laughs> glasses and all those things. <laughs> all the things but, I love about you. <laughs> all the things. Um, but I definitely, I also want to come in and look at GLA as what is our next generation of GLA. Let's talk about because I'm also a business mind entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about our Ben strength. Let's talk about our, you know, our healthy organizational growth. Like who are going to, who's the next generation of leaders for GLA and who, who is going to bring it to um, the masses and the communities that have the biggest outreach and biggest voices. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And so also tapping into our, as much as, you know, 
I love some celebrities and there's a lot out there and I hate that it's celebrities that really have to make this push, but yeah. it is like, we need to ask them for support. We yeah. need them to be vulnerable and open about them, their stories and align with the right organizations um, like the Global Lyme Alliance to share their stories and bring awareness around this cause to individuals, especially the youth who are at the most risk for Lyme because they have you know, they're outdoors, they're active, they're getting, you know, mm -hmm. getting involved in these areas that are high, you know, high pandemic, er like epidemic areas. So we, we need those celebrities to reach those masses. So those masses can get educated and then further get involved. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, it's about that advocacy work. It's about growing GLA and then creating additionally supporting Laura and all these organizations in synergy and strategy mm -hmm. for better, um, better results in let's like, Hey, what's our rally cry? Like, are we going to go for like getting a definitive test for Lyme mm -hmm. so that when people reach out to any of us in, in the Lyme organization, we have an answer, go get tested. Yep. Here's this, here's that go after this. We have, we have backed research, we have the results. So I think that's something I personally really want to work towards is creating that those conversations mm -hmm. with all of the organizations and GLA is is just a, a vehicle to be able to do that and support, you know, our our community and then building out our educational platform as well, because I think education is always something probably missing a little bit in this field yeah. and it's a little difficult to navigate to your point, because so many people have different different things that work for them in terms mm -hmm. of treatment or symptoms or whatnot. So the inconsistency is what we need to clear up mm -hmm. in terms Absolutely. of education. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. So switching gears a little bit, um, a lot of a big question that people have, you know, when you have Lyme is like, can you have a baby? Can, are you going to pass Lyme to your child? Like it's no one really knows. There's not enough research on this. This is another area that needs to be researched as well. Um, but you have an amazing, beautiful family. And I know that you use both surrogate options yeah. and you also carried. So we'd love to hear your experience on both and how your body felt through both of those experiences. You know, I know doing like the egg retrieval and IVF isn't something easy on our bodies either, especially someone mm -hmm. that's sick with Lyme. So um, would love if you could share a little bit about that journey, because I know a lot of people have questions about this, this topic. Oh, yes. I love this topic. And I <laughs> love this topic on a one on one. So if anyone is listening who is struggling with this, please reach out, you know, Holistic Umbrella uh, social media, because I really want to help navigate new mothers or potential mothers or women in mm -hmm. this field that are just like, I am afraid to have children. I can't do this. Yeah. I don't want, you know, I don't want to pass it on. I don't want them to suffer. So mm -hmm. um, I don't talk about this as much in a public setting, but I'm really glad that you're bringing it up because I think there is a whole other community mm -hmm. of these women and mothers that are fearful of this. So I yeah. want to speak to it. One, I want to identify that Lyme disease is a, is known as a vector-borne illness, right? So vector-borne, meaning it can be passed on through a vector. So it, I wholeheartedly believe it can be sexually transmitted and it can be transmitted in utero. And now that transmission, I think, is what is difficult to, to study. And I think one of the reasons it's difficult to study is, one, we don't do a ton of studies with um, pregnant women, you yeah. know, because of the risks, yeah. right? And we don't want to impact the fetus mm -hmm. um, because of that risk, nor do I. I don't, I don't want to do that for mm -hmm. sure. But there is some research that was released, um, I think, in Canada prior to when I, before I had kids that um, showed the existence of Lyme in the in the uteral fluid. Mm -hmm. And so we know it, it is a risk. And we have women in our organization and other who ha linked their stories to their kids having Lyme mm -hmm. and they believe that they've you know given it to their mm -hmm. children. So it is a risk. I just want to be clear at, at that. So obviously being diagnosed with Lyme, doing my research, being an educated, you know, individual in the space, I was very fearful. Mm -hmm. Now I spoke to about three different doctors and I asked them, I said, you know, you know, if I was to get pregnant, would this be an issue? And they're like, no, no, it's not an issue. Da, da, da. And I just felt something in my heart that I was really concerned about. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, I, 
I did have my child through IVF and it was a very difficult decision for me for a handful of reasons. One, because of my religious upbringing Mm -hmm. and two, because I was still not like I was better, Mm -hmm. but I wasn't like cured by any means. You weren't feeling a hundred percent and still struggling with your health. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't feeling 100%. And it's scary to do anything in those moments too because you're just like, it's taken me so long to get here and like any little thing can just set the lime off again or, you know, make you take five steps back and you don't know anytime you do something to your body, you don't know what effect it's going to have. Oh, it's terrifying, yeah. right? It's like you slip back into everything and yep. I feel that. Like when I feel my lime, there's mm-hmm. like this, I'm like, oh gosh, I feel it. Mm-hmm. Okay, we got to go back, like go back, mm-hmm. clean, clean, you know. Um, But what I was saying is I, you know, I also struggled with female hormones because of my Lyme. So I wasn't having cycles. Mm -hmm. I didn't have like enough progesterone or even estrogen to carry a baby. Mm -hmm. Um, So I struggled even with that. So getting pregnant was also, you know, very limited on my personal health at that time. Mm -hmm. And then in addition to my Lyme, it was almost felt like nearly impossible. So I I decided to go through surrogacy. And again, this is a very godly story. I'll, I'll share a little bit more of a personal. And then if you want me to get into some medical, I'm happy to. But I was going to PT for Lyme and I was going to a, a place who did um, aquatics. So mm-hmm. I did like water aerobics. Mm-hmm. Essentially, I was I was. <laughs> I was the youngest person there by like 50 years. And but hey, I when you have live, you feel like you're 100 years old. So you fit right in body wise, right? I fit <laughs> right in. We were the golden girls. And I, was, I love this. Yeah, it, it was so funny. I fit right in. And I was learning basically to get my energy. I know it sounds crazy to walk. Mm-hmm. Like I couldn't walk long distances. Yep. So I was going to aquatic therapy to build up that resistance again, to be able to walk and like lift stuff, like just mm-hmm. even my basic muscles, just muscle strength, um, endurance. Mm-hmm. So I was going and my PT therapist said, oh my gosh, I think it would be so fascinating scientifically to carry a baby, but not have kids. And I'm thinking, who would want to do that? Mm-hmm. Like, I just thought to myself, like, that sounds crazy. <laughs> like, I don't want to, I don't want to be pregnant. Like, yeah. I, I feel like. It sounds like the worst thing, yeah. you know, at that time. It's a lot on your body, like, right? <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Like I'm in my 20s and I'm like, oh my gosh. So I Google this. I'm like, can you be pregnant and not have a kid? Like I just didn't even know what that is. Yeah. And surrogacy came up. Mm-hmm. And I was so, you know, I was just so out of touch with the concept. It's It's been around for a long time. It's not very common. Then it became really common, mm-hmm. you know. And I'm trying to think when this was. I can't remember the exact date, but... Um, it was so interesting. So I, I, I approached my husband and I said, Hey, Colin, like, did you know, this is a thing? Like people have babies for people and in, in many ways. And he's like, no, that's weird. We're not doing that. And I was like, <laughs> okay, well, I think it's a really good option for us. Like, I don't think I can have kids. Like if you want a family, like this is really going to be the option. And I really, we really believed we didn't, we couldn't have kids. So I'll, I'll end. Um, that was a real serious thing. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, for 10 plus years, we didn't, obviously that was a problem. And then we, we finally sold into it. We found an amazing agency. We were interviewing surrogates and I met, when I met my surrogate, she walked in, she was a single mom. I won't give her name, but she was a single mom. She was absolutely the light of my life. We immediately started crying and just hugging each other. Mm -hmm. It was like, we were meant to know each mm-hmm. other in the life. We were sisters from like another, you know, life. It was so amazing. She had both of my kids. Mm-hmm. Um, we had the most amazing experience. I know that's not always the experience. I had an amazing one, but I have to say God was part of that whole process. We prayed to St. Gianna Mola, who uh, passed away. She made a decision to give birth to her daughter and she ended up passing away from birth. So mm-hmm. she's the patron saint of um, childbirth mm. and um, mothers who struggle to have have kids and mm. pregnancy. So I her feast day was actually this past. Um, it was actually yesterday. Oh, wow. Yesterday nice. was her feast day. Amazing. So we prayed to her every day. And my son, Hudson, my first, uh, was born uh, April 21st, 2019, Mm -hmm. on Easter Day, which is the biggest religious holiday, Mm -hmm. on Easter Day, on the um, 
the uh, feast day of St. Gianna Mola. It's, it's like crazy. Wow. It was like the all these godly things. Yeah. The coincidences <laughs> were crazy. And yeah, he was he was just changed my entire life. Mm-hmm. So we were so blessed. The surrogacy process was amazing. Um, now the IVF process was horrific. Mm. I got extremely ill. I was hyperstemmed where my ovaries um, swelled up. Oh I gosh. looked about six months pregnant. Um, I almost was hospitalized. I it took me. I was sick. I was sick with like fatigue and and brain fog and and cramps and bloating mm. and hormone imbalances and depression for a good six months. Wow. Um, Before. And then probably another year just to get to a point where I was like, okay, like I feel somewhat normal. So that was, that was a very difficult time Mm -hmm. um, when I did my first round of IVF. And it was a very difficult round of IVF. I, I only had Hudson through that round, which is really rare when you're Mm -hmm. that young. So Mm -hmm. I would say that was really difficult. And I think knowing what I know now, um, my second round of IVF, when I had my daughter, I did um, light stimulation, so I didn't do as much hormones Mm -hmm. to produce as many eggs. Mm. I used a doctor who she was really focused on doing my natural cycle and then just stimulating me more naturally with like the right type of hormones Mm -hmm. for egg retrieval. And that was so much smoother. So I would say less is more when you're ill. Yeah. And have a doctor that listens to you, that understands you have this chronic illness, you have these fears, you have this situation, and it has a decent bedside manner because mm-hmm. I think it's really important to have a physician support you, especially in a very, very vulnerable, by the way, yep. very vulnerable Absolutely. situation. Mm-hmm. I mean, your eggs are potential life, yep. you know, and when you create life in a, a non traditional sense of the word, it is a very emotional and vulnerable mm-hmm. and difficult, you know, process. It shouldn't be transactional. It mm-hmm. really should be all encompassing in having, you know, faith, having, you know, hope, educating yourself, mm-hmm. talking to your doctor, getting that support, having a partner, all those things that are amazing. But I know everybody has great intention mm-hmm. for that life being mm-hmm. created. So that was a blessing. Yeah, absolutely. That was a blessing. And then you recently had your third addition to the family yes. on, and you, you carried that one on your own. How did, how is that different from doing the IVF? How did your body feel through pregnancy? And did you do anything while you were pregnant to try to make sure that you and the baby were as healthy as possible? The, okay. So Erica, it was a complete shock when I got pregnant. I called <laughs> both doctors. And You're like, like, are you sure this can't be happening? What? Yeah. Like I went in and I called her and she's like, oh my God. She was so excited. <laughs> and I even told my surrogate and my surrogate was like, I prayed for this. I wanted you to have this experience. And oh she my was gosh. So, everybody was so supportive. Mm-hmm. I know that there was a hesitation. My mother was like, are you going to be okay? Mm-hmm. Like she was like so fearful. I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. But you know what? Like this this feeling of being pregnant, I was terrified, but Mm -hmm. I was also like, there was a piece to me that was like, it's going to be okay. Like there's a plan. It's going to be okay. So, um, pregnancy was awful. I didn't sleep. It was like, I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Okay. So (laughs) like, I see a lot of women around me, they hold babies. Like it's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Like they're so cute. And now I like really appreciate it, but it was awful. I didn't sleep at all. I had a but on top of my Lyme, which I felt was like, it didn't like reactivate, but I had to be very sensitive about mm-hmm. it. Like I, when I, I, I had a very stressful full-time job, I worked all the way up to date of delivery. Um, I had higher blood pressure at, towards the end, which was really scary because mm-hmm. I don't have higher blood pressure. I usually have low. So I really had to be careful about putting my feet up, getting proper circulation, Mm -hmm. hydration, flushing, 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 eating a right diet, getting all my supplements. My supplements, I think, kept me through it, like Mm -hmm. making sure the baby had enough nutrition um, and also doing folate, not folic acid, during with my prenatal. So that's Mm -hmm. a huge thing too because doing my research, folic acid is just not the best for cerebral development. It's folate. Mm -hmm. And – it was difficult. 
but so worth it. I can't even tell you like <laughs> if you know if that's a journey you go on like it's so worth it. You have this child and you're like, oh my gosh, I just created this human mm-hmm. and an organ and a, like yes. all this stuff. And it's amazing what our bodies can do. And that was also a reason that I, I got more involved in, in uh, Lyme advocacy because I wanted answers for my kids. Mm-hmm. Like I don't want them to be at risk. If something happens and they get it and they get bit, you know, and they get Lyme, I want, I want to know what to do. Yep. Cause absolutely. I, like, you know, it, it terrifies me. And also I know that the body does amazing things and it can heal mm-hmm. and produce great results if we give it and feed it the right things it needs mm-hmm. to do that. So I'm hopeful for that. Um, I would say you asked me what I did during pregnancy. I did. Um, I didn't take, I was really clean diet. Mm-hmm. Diet was like important besides like I did have a salt bagel and cream cheese. Like that was like my <laughs> that one. delicious. <laughs> it was like my one craving. I had like bad nausea. I, like, I just need a salt bagel. Um, but I was really clean eating. Um, and I did compression like mm-hmm. socks. Like mm-hmm. I wore those a lot for like circulation. circulation. It was hu- circulation was huge for me um, because I also think that also is helpful for the detox. The supplements I mentioned, so also magnesium at night, that was super helpful not only for the baby but for my body to relax. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, keeping electronics away from me and away from the baby or away from my body. I w- mm-hmm. I'm very sensitive to like technology and phones and stuff. And Mm -hmm. I can feel almost like it sounds weird, but I feel the EMFs from like technology. So Mm -hmm. I have to keep all of that stuff away. No TV in my bedroom, none of that. Um, So I could try to come down and rest. And one of the biggest things that helped me that is great for women who are pregnant was soaking my feet or doing an Epsom salt bath. Mm -hmm. Um, Hot water was like my savior. I just wanted (laughs) to be in like hot water the whole time. Um, yeah, the baby, uh, Lennox, uh, came out, uh, a week early. He was the biggest baby. I, I <laughs> of my three, he was so healthy and Aww. he's doing so great. Good. Um, and all, yeah, all my kids are thriving and I'm just, I'm so happy. Obviously we have, we have some immune things that we're working through. And mm-hmm. as a mom, you always get worried and I get like, oh my gosh, what if, what if, but I don't want to think that way. I just want to be proactive and educated. And I'm, I'm very, you know, somewhat strict, I guess. I would be some, I think my, uh, you know, my family would be, you're pretty strict, Ken's, but yeah. diet is very important for my mm-hmm. little kiddos and their, um, you know, the proper nutrition for their growth too and their health. Mm-hmm. Awesome. I'm so happy to hear that all three are doing so yeah. well and so excited for Thank you. you. Amazing. Blessed. And so you do have an exciting event coming up. So uh, here in SoCal, if anyone is available on May 18th, you're doing a Global Lime Alliance fundraiser and art show. Do you want to share a little bit about that event? So if people are local, they can try to make it as well. Yes. Oh, my gosh. I am so excited. So I I love art. It's, a, it's kind of more of a hobby and a passion. I love curating art. I do it a little bit for my job in the hotels when we do renovations. I love being part of the art selection process. But personally, I like would love, you know, to get have a gallery one day or open a children's museum, which I might that's all on my uh, bucket list. But I wanted to bring art into the healing process of chronic illness and Lyme is it, there's such a there's such an emotional, you know, um, piece to having illness. Right. Mm -hmm. And I feel like people use art to express that emotion. If it's, if it's struggles, if it's joy, whatever it may be. And I was talking, like, I thought of this idea and I told Laura, I said, look, we need to have an event on the West coast. We are not well represented here on the West coast. We need to do better. And so I want to do this annual art show every year. I want it to be the biggest event on the West Coast that supports Lyme advocacy and fundraising for Lyme disease specifically. Mm-hmm. I fund everything myself and every single dollar, the tickets sold, the art auctioned, every single dollar, dollar goes directly to the Global Lyme Alliance, GLA. Mm-hmm. And I just love opening up my home. I love hosting. I love meeting people. I love hearing people's stories. I love getting involved. So I really hope that people come. 
We have beautiful pieces donated um, mm-hmm. by Allie Hilfiger. A huge shout Amazing. out to her. Thank you to Amazing. Allie. I know. I'm I'm so excited. She's mm-hmm. really such a passionate and emotional artist. And I'm excited to have a piece there. And what will be awesome is, um, you know, individuals will be able to bid online or bid in person. And once they secure the bid and we close the auction, you can take that piece home or we'll ship it for you. And all of those proceeds are donations directly to GLA. So that, um, it's a great opportunity to, you know, have a little fun, mm-hmm. but connect and do something good for Absolutely. a community that needs it. Yeah. To bring more awareness. So we're, we're going to be showcasing um, a little preview of the quiet epidemic um, and really supporting Lindsay keys and a, uh, Daria and the work that they do trying to promote, um, you know, what's not being heard Mm -hmm. and the truths about Lyme disease. And um, Laura McNeil, CEO, she'll be there from Global Lyme Alliance and she'll speak a little bit about what we're doing. And I just, I love hosting. So yeah, anybody that's local, anybody that you think you're struggling with Lyme, you're impacted, you know someone with Lyme, please come. Or if you want to um, check out some amazing art and add art to your collection yes. at home, it's a great cause to support and yes. get a new piece for your home as well. Yes, Thank Amazing. You. Yeah, yes. So fun. we'll uh, we'll link to that in the show notes here so anyone in SoCal can, can try to attend that as well. So amazing. Well, thank you, Kenzie. It's been so great catching up with you and sharing some of your amazing story. I hope that this helps people on their journey. Um, If you guys want to meet Kenzie, make sure to try to make it to her SoCal fundraiser and stay tuned for more episodes at The Trail to Health. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, Erica. Bye.